In the unfolding of history, from a Christian perspective, it is important to remember there is a scheduled timeline of events. And throughout this timeline, time and time again, a man appears, a man shrouded in mystery, a man shrouded in darkness. This man, an enigma wrapped in prophetic writings, walks in the shadows of future history, leaving footprints that are both elusive and profound. His presence, his spirit, is already in the world today, yet his arrival is anticipated. His arrival is like a dark cloud that looms over the horizon, casting a long shadow over the unfolding saga of mankind's history. The man of sin, the man of lawlessness, the first beast, the son of perdition, is coming. As we live our lives each day in the end of days, it becomes increasingly more evident that we are not merely passive spectators, but active participants in a narrative of epic proportions. We are living in the last days the Bible warned us about. We are living in the last days the Bible speaks of. We are living in Matthew chapter 24. We are living in the beginning of sorrows. We are living in an age of wars and rumors of wars. We are living in an age where nations are rising against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. We are living in an age of famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. The notion that the world is at a crossroads is not cliché. It's a stark reality for those who see the world through the lens of the Bible. The clock of history is not just ticking, it is pulsating with the heartbeat of prophetic fulfillment. This ticking is not a mere counting down, but a counting towards. Because history is not moving here, there, and everywhere, the Bible is clear history is moving from a beginning in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, and it is moving towards an end in Revelation chapter 22. Therefore, this ticking is not a mere counting down, but a counting towards prophetic fulfillment, a counting towards the book of Revelation, a counting towards the consummation of all things. Every tick, every talk, is a step closer to the arrival of a conclusion scripted by God. We are not talking tonight of an airy-fairy invention. We are talking about the ticking of the clock, and the turning of the calendar, and the passing of the years, which is inexorably, unceasingly, unstoppably moving to the arrival of this man of sin, the first beast, the lawless one, the son of perdition, the wicked one, the Antichrist himself. Today's world is woven with threads of uncertainty and tension. The fabric of peace seems to be unraveling at an alarming pace. A cursory glance at headlines on any major news channel will show you that there is a tremendous amount of global tension between different nations and kingdoms. Each day, the headlines are a testament to a global community on the brink, with nations poised in a delicate balance that could tip into the abyss of a catastrophic World War III. It's a reality that cannot be ignored. The world is witnessing an increase in conflicts and confrontations not seen in recent memory. Tensions simmer in regions known and unknown, from the long-standing strife in the Middle East to the rising unease in Europe, from the South China Sea's territorial disputes to the ever-volatile tensions in other parts of the world. The chessboard of international politics is laid bare, with each move bringing a potential spark that could ignite the tinderbox of global conflict. In this context, and with this backdrop, a question arises. Will the Antichrist stop World War III? To answer this question, we must first understand who the Antichrist is. The Antichrist, as described in the Holy Scriptures, is a figure shrouded in darkness and mystery. He is the end times false messiah, a master of deception, cloaked in the guise of a savior, but harboring intentions most sinister. His emergence is foretold as a pivotal moment in the grand narrative of biblical prophecy, a climax in the cosmic battle between good and evil. The Antichrist is not just another player on the world stage. He is a pivotal figure, prophesied to rise in power, achieving a level of global dominance unprecedented in human history. His ambition? To orchestrate the downfall of Israel, to crush the followers of Jesus Christ, and to establish his reign of terror. He is the embodiment of all that stands against God, a stark antithesis to the message of love and redemption that Christ brought to the world. The scriptures paint a vivid picture of his character, charismatic yet cunning, powerful yet pernicious. 
a leader who will captivate many with his promises of peace and prosperity, but whose heart beats with malevolent intent. The rise of the Antichrist, as prophesied, is not a matter of if, but of when. His ascension to power is intertwined with the unfolding events of the end times and the Book of Revelation, a period marked by turmoil and tribulation. In the Book of Revelation, his figure looms large, a central character in the drama that leads to the final showdown between light and darkness. But amidst this backdrop of prophecy and prediction, the question lingers in the air, almost tangible in its urgency. Will the Antichrist stop World War III? It's a question that stirs the soul. The truth is, Scripture does not explicitly state that the Antichrist will stop World War III. Anyone claiming he will or won't is offering their opinion. I personally do not believe there will be a World War III, simply due to the fact that the power of modern-day weaponry now is drastically different from what it was during the 20th century. The evolution of weaponry from World War I and II to the modern era represents a drastic transformation, marked by technological advancements that have fundamentally altered the nature of warfare. During World War I, combat was characterized by trench warfare and relatively primitive weapons like bolt-action rifles, machine guns, and mustard gas. Artillery was the dominant force on the battlefield, causing the majority of casualties. World War II saw significant advancements with the introduction of more sophisticated tanks, aircraft, and so on. Advancements in technology have given rise to smart weapons, unmanned systems like drones, and cyber warfare capabilities that can disrupt enemy infrastructure without a physical presence. Today's military arsenal includes precision-guided munitions, advanced missile defense systems, and stealth technology enabling forces to strike with remarkable accuracy from great distances. Nuclear weapons have also evolved, with today's arsenals capable of far more destruction than those used in World War II. The weaponry is so powerful that I do not believe there will be one before the Antichrist arrives. However, it is important to note that when the Antichrist does arrive, he will come as a man of peace. It is plausible and it could be a scenario where he stops the world from hurtling into war as a man of peace. Notice my choice of words. It is a plausible scenario. I'm not stating for one moment that this is what will happen. But the world would listen to a man who stops it from hurtling into war. The current global landscape, marked by significant political tensions and unrest, is not merely a coincidence, but a crucial piece in the prophetic puzzle. This climate of instability and disorder sets the stage for the emergence of the Antichrist. Leading up to the arrival of the Antichrist, the world will be in a state very similar to today. A divided world, a lot like the world we see today. The world in its current state is crying out for peace, a deep, resounding yearning that echoes across nations riven by conflict and division. This universal cry is for peace, the conditions we are witnessing are precisely the condition that could pave the way for the Antichrist, prophesied to rise as a beacon of false peace. In the Bible, Daniel 8.25 foretells, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. This passage vividly depicts the Antichrist's deceptive nature, using peace as a guise for his true intentions. Another Bible verse that supports the claim the Antichrist will arrive as a figure who initially appears as a bringer of peace is found in 1 Thessalonians 5.3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. They will perceive the world as being in a state of peace and security, but this tranquility will be abruptly shattered, akin to how labor pains suddenly seize a pregnant woman. During the early stages of the tribulation, a period of trials and tribulation following the rapture, unbelievers will be lulled into a deceptive sense of peace and safety. However, this period of calm will prove to be fleeting and misleading. In Daniel 9.27, Scripture speaks of a peace treaty indicating an agreement that will be forged by the Antichrist 
and then broken midway through the tribulation period. Daniel 9.27 And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. The passage details a period of apparent peace or stability initiated by this enigmatic figure. The covenant with many for one week is typically understood as a seven-year treaty, a period symbolic of completeness in biblical numerology. This covenant is particularly significant because it implies a temporary period of peace or normalcy. However, the prophecy foretells a betrayal of this agreement. In the middle of the week, which would be after three and a half years, the Antichrist will break this covenant. This abrupt shift marks a pivotal moment in eschatological events. In simple terms, this passage is often interpreted as the Antichrist making a peace treaty or covenant, particularly with Israel, for seven years, but breaking it halfway through, revealing his true nature. Revelation 6, 2 And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. Among Bible scholars, there is a general consensus that the first rider of the four horsemen of the Apocalypse is the Antichrist, the rider on the white horse. The choice of a white horse is particularly significant. In biblical symbolism, white often represents purity, righteousness, and victory. This color is commonly associated with Christ himself, especially in the context of his second coming, as depicted in Revelation 19.11. However, the writer in Revelation 6-2 presents a stark contrast. While the horse is white, symbolizing peace and righteousness, the actions of the rider do not align with these attributes. He carries a bow and is granted a crown, suggesting authority and intent to conquer, but significantly there is no mention of arrows, which implies a conquest achieved through nonviolent means, perhaps through cunning, diplomacy, or deception. The imagery of a white horse, typically symbolizing peace, is seen in contrast with his actions of conquering, suggesting a deceptive appearance of peace. In summary, the imagery of the rider on the white horse in Revelation, when interpreted as the Antichrist, serves as a powerful metaphor for the ultimate deceiver. He is a figure who appears as a beacon of hope and peace, symbolized by the white horse, but whose underlying purpose is conquest and domination as indicated by his actions and the crown of authority he wears. The Antichrist's ascent to power will be marked by his portrayal as a man of peace, a charismatic leader emerging from the chaos of global unrest. He will offer solutions to the world's myriad problems, seducing many with promises of stability and harmony. And I do believe if an individual were to come and offer peace to this world we are living in, people would look up to that man, and even dare I say it, even worship him. What is the one thing the world is crying for right now? That is peace. I am not saying for one moment the Antichrist is coming in 2024. The truth is, I do not know when he will come. However, my point is simple. To urge you to look at the world's desperate need and calls for peace and also look at the Bible's description of how the Antichrist will rise as a man of peace. And I sometimes wonder at how the Antichrist will unite the world into peace and unite the world in accepting him alone as its leader. The fact that the world will unite under the leadership of this one man should show you several things, one of which is the level of deception and the sheer power of the Antichrist's deception. When in history has all of mankind listened and obeyed the rule of one man? When in history has the world come together in peace under the rule of one man? When in history has the world viewed one man as God? When in history have people put aside their social political ideologies to follow one man? When in history has all of mankind put their religious beliefs aside to worship one man? When in history has the entire world been required to bear a mark or symbol as a means of allegiance to a single leader? When in history has there been a global economic system so tightly controlled that buying and selling are impossible without allegiance to one ruler? 
When in history has a leader been able to perform miraculous signs and wonders on such a scale that they deceive nations? When in history has a single political figure managed to broker peace in the Middle East, particularly between Israel and its neighbors? When in history has a leader risen with such charisma and authority that their rule is accepted across diverse and often conflicting cultural boundaries? The Bible tells us when in history this takes place, and that is in Revelation chapter 13. We grossly underestimate the pure and sheer supernatural deception that will occur during the rise of the Antichrist. What he will do is nothing short of supernatural. It will not be a natural accomplishment. But we know that he will not naturally accomplish this, for we know he is given his power by the dragon, and he is energized by the very gates of hell itself. In this world, woven with threads of uncertainty and tension where the fabric of peace seems to be unraveling, I come to you with a message of unshakable assurance. God is still on his throne. Yes, in the midst of a global unrest, in the face of threats and fears, let us remember this foundational truth. God is still on the throne. Think about it. When John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the river, and that voice from heaven declared, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God was on his throne. And even when John the Baptist faced his tragic end, beheaded for his unwavering faith, God was still reigning supremely. God is still on the throne. This truth, my brothers and sisters, is our anchor in the storm. As we navigate through these times, times that the Bible has warned us about, times filled with wars, rumors of wars, nations rising against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms, let us hold on to this truth. God is still on the throne. Uh, we might be living in what seems like the beginning of sorrows, an era that looks like the unfolding events of the book of Revelation. But even then, even when the Antichrist takes center stage in human civilization, I need you to know, I need you to believe, I need you to hold on to this. God is still on the throne. In your personal life, when disaster strikes, when your world seems to crumble, when you feel all alone, remember this, God is still on the throne. His sovereignty is not dependent on our circumstances. His reign is not determined by the chaos of this world. His power is not diminished by the schemes of man or the rise of any antichrist. No, God is still on the throne. You see, things do not have to turn out the way we think they ought to for God to be sovereign. His ways are higher than our ways, His thoughts higher than our thoughts. When we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. Even in the midst of turmoil, even when the nations are in uproar, God is still on the throne. Our focus should not be solely on the prophetic fulfillments, not just on the ticking of the clock towards the end times. Our focus should be on the one who holds time in his hands, the one who sits above all the earth, the one who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. God is still on the throne, so do not be troubled. Do not let your heart be weighed down by fear. Do not look at the chaos of the world in despair. Instead, look to God who is unchanging, steadfast, and sovereign. Look to God whose love for us was so great that he sent his only son to save us. Look to God, who has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. In every moment, in every situation, in every high and every low, let this be your declaration, let this be your faith, let this be your unwavering conviction, God is still on the throne.